So this morning, I'm going to give you part two on this series. And you know, it's so unique. I don't speak much about finances because sometimes so many people, they can say that's not churchy, it's not spiritual, but sometimes we got to take off the hood and we got to deal with some issues. You know, my father, Apostle Fenton, he's probably watching us right now and he's getting, you know, this is a tough allergy season for him, so we'll keep you in prayer, Apostle. And he taught me when I was a child and he said that there's three phases. He said there's what's called the survival level. Someone said with me survival level. Then he said there's what's called the sufficiency level. Say with me sufficiency level. And then he said the third level is called the surplus level. And he says what happens is survival is when you're just fighting to survive. Does anyone know what I'm talking about in here? You just say, man, I, I just was trying to get through the day. And then when you cross or it go beyond the survival level, you get to a sufficiency level. You know, I, I have enough to cover my needs. And then he says, but then there's a surplus level. When you have more than enough, hallelujah, to cover even the needs you have, so you have some that's left over. And what he explained to me, even as a child, he says, the devil fights to keep God's children beneath the survival level. Someone's going to hear me in a second this morning. And he says, and what we have to learn to do is to not only fight to survive, but we have to get to a sufficiency level. And then when we get to a sufficiency level, we have to realize that's not only where God wants me. God wants to take me to a level of surplus. Oh, someone's going to hear me in a second. So that I can bless and go above and beyond with the needs that I have. And so this morning, I want to speak a word of faith that if you are fighting to survive, the Lord's going to take you through that survival level. If you're fighting through the survival level, God will take you to a sufficiency level. And if you're right now thinking, I've made it, I'm at the sufficiency level, God wants you at a surplus level. And if you're at the surplus level, God wants you to live in an abundant level. Oh, someone's going to hear me this morning. Just say with me, we're all moving up a level. Go ahead and say that. Now, if you're ready for this message today, I want you to say, yes, Lord, I'm ready. Go ahead and say that. Because it's a matter of faith, my Lord. You've got to see it, you've got to believe it, and you've got to embrace it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse, 2 Corinthians actually, chapter 9 and verse 5, I'm going to read to you a scripture that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 5. And he says, Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time, and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. Now right here, the Apostle Paul, he's writing this letter to a church in Corinthians, and, and to this Corinthian church, there was a need all throughout Galatia. And so what the Apostle Paul was saying is he went to all the churches and he said, we're going to bless those who are in distress. Someone say with me, we're here to be a blessing. Go ahead and say that. Say it, say it again. Say, I'm here to be a blessing. Go ahead and say it. Say, God will bless me. Go ahead and say it. So that I can be a blessing. Go ahead and say that. And so the Apostle Paul was actually taking the church through this, and he had actually walked with this particular church. And if you read the verses before this, it says that this church was very zealous. In other words, they said, we see that need, and we want to deal with that need at an elevated level. And it was so zealous and so full of energy and joy that when he spread to the other churches what this church was going to do, it triggered other churches' faith. My Lord, I want to speak a blessing right now. And, and, and so what he did is after they made that commitment, they said, we're going to step up and we're going to bless those people who are in famine. Paul said, okay. He came to them at a later date. He said, I'm coming back. I'm sending some people back to collect the gift. <laughs> hey, have you ever made a promise in zeal, but yet when it was time to fulfill it, your zeal went down? Someone talked to me this morning. <laughs> you guys are so silent. So, so he said, All right, I'm sending some people back to remind you of your promise. I'm sending some people back so, so that when they come back, to receive what you promised and what you encouraged everyone else through with your zeal, you can actually do it and fulfill it. Someone's going to hear me this morning. And so what he says, this generous gift beforehand, which you previously promised, that it, that it might be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. 
You know, first question, have you promised God anything, someone? Have you made a commitment to God about what you will do for him, sow into his kingdom, what you, the man or the woman that you will be for him? These are your promises, your covenants with God, that everything you have, all that you are, you owe to God. Do I have any witnesses of that in here? And that when you came and gave your life to Jesus and you said you're Lord of all, that means you are Lord of all and everything in my life. Well, what he says is when he comes back, and Paul was saying that I want you to fulfill this with a generous spirit, but not as a grudging obligation. So this isn't just talking about fulfilling the promises you've made, but it's talking about your attitude and how you are and who you are when you're fulfilling the obligation. But this grudging obligation is not talking about the person who's going to fulfill the promise. When you research this, and in some of your Bibles, you may see the word that it may be done as a generous gift and not as exploitation. You see, what Paul was addressing, and I hope, hear me, I want you to pray as you listen to this message so that the Holy Spirit will, will fill in the blanks that I can't fill in due to my own inadequacy, amen? But what Paul was saying is that there's some exploitation that's happening. And he's speaking here not from the people who are giving, He's speaking on to the people who are coming back to collect the giving. Someone's going to hear me in a second. And what he's saying is there must not be any exploitation. Oh, someone's going to hear me. That when we go to collect and when we come, and this is a leadership message, and, and when we come, there must not, it must not be done with the expectation that this is how I'm going to get my fancy car. This is how I'm going to get my fancy coat. This is how I'm going to get my big house. And, and, and it's not done to exploit or to exact out of people things that's going to benefit a person or an individual out of an exploitive spirit. And I, I want to speak to you right now. Can I, as a pastor, or as a brother to brothers and sisters, we have to be discerning of giving versus exploitation. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. Sometimes we hear from so many different people. We hear all of these pleas and all these calls, but what's the spirit of the one who's making the call? Oh, someone needs to hear me this morning. Is it one where they say there's a famine and we're going to heal those that are distressing? Or is it one out of an exploited spirit? That says the more I have, the better I am, so it keeps on pulling and pulling and pulling. So what Paul is saying here is, I'm sending some people to remind you of your promise. But the way they're going to do this, you're going to realize that it should be done out of generosity and not out of a spirit of exploitation. Amen, church? We have to be discerning. Hallelujah. The first point I want to share with you is your faith in God influences the stewardship of your finances. I, I have learned this time and time again I've learned this from my parents. One of the first phrases they taught me this morning, I don't know why I'm quoting my parents so much. They must be on my mind and my heart this morning. One of the messages my dad taught me early is he says the problem with so many believers is they don't trust God. It's a matter of trust. That there's nothing God will ever ask you to do that he will not outperform what you do for him. And so that God just says, trust me, trust me, trust me. It's like a lifeguard who's leading a person out of the water, and they just say, grab my hand. And that person says, how do I know I should grab your hand? And that lifeguard is saying, I am extending myself to pull you out of your need, to pull you out of your survival mode. Do you trust me enough to put your hand in my hand, my Lord? And sometimes in our life, we will look at God, we will look at God's word, but we won't trust him. Oh, Jesus, help me, Lord. We won't trust him to do what he says to do, to put our hand in his hand when he says, you can put your hand in my hand, to believe that he will perform what he's declared throughout ages that he will perform. And I want to encourage you this morning, church, to trust God, to put all your faith in him. No matter what you think or how you feel about it, God will never disappoint you. God will always outperform what someone else has told you, my Lord, my Lord. So when we have that faith in God and you put all your trust, it influences every area of your life. Do I have any witnesses of that in here this morning? 
Has God ever disappointed someone in here? My Lord, he's never disappointed me. There's been times he's told me to do some things and to keep doing them, and I've run out of patience. I felt like real talk. Where I said, man, Lord, I, I did this and I thought I'd have been blessed by now. And it's taken me a lot longer to, 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 to reap that harvest than I thought it would take. But in the end, God has never disappointed me. It's always been best to remain faithful. In verse 6, he says, but this I say, he, and this could be he or she, who sows sparingly. Someone say with me, sparingly will also reap how? Sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap how? Bountifully. So what he is talking about here, the second point is the measure of what you sow determines the amount of what you will reap. We call this the law of sowing and reaping. So that if you have, if you look at a farmer and that farmer has seed, I wish I had some seeds in my hand as an illustration. But if you had seeds, if a farmer had a whole handful of seeds and he took a seed, he said, I'm just going to plant one seed. He takes one seed, throws it in the ground, but he keeps all the rest of the seed in his hand. And then the rain comes, and then it goes day after day. Are you, would you expect a big harvest? No. Now, why not, somebody? You only sowed one seed. You see, if you sow sparingly, you're only going to reap sparingly. But when you take all the seed and you sow bountifully, then when the same winds, the same sun rises and sets, the same season, what's your harvest? It's going to be bountifully. So the measure of what you reap is determined by the measure of what you sow. Do I have any witness of this in the house this morning? My Lord. Let's talk about this just for a moment. Why is that important? You you know, I was thinking of this illustration. There's all different kinds of seed, you you know, and one of the things that Pastor Aubrey likes is I like sunflower seeds. And and how many many sunflower seeds lovers are there out there? And, and, you know, it's one of those things where you can't eat one. (laughs) You you know, someone will give you a bag of sunflower seed and you just take, you know, and first you got to suck it a little bit and get the salt off it. Yes, and then you chew it and just let, you know, meditate on it for a little bit. And then you take another one and then you suck that one and get the salt off. And, and it gets contagious after a while. And, 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 you know, I was thinking, I said, the problem is sometimes when the Lord puts seed in our hands, we treat it like sunflower seeds or the way I do. We, 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 we don't want to sow them. We want to eat them. Oh, Lord. And, and, and so we take it and the seed that we should sow We say, this is the seed that I should eat and consume and take. And one of the things that the Lord was dealing with me on is don't eat all the seed. Someone's going to hear me this morning. That there's seed that meets your need and then there's seed that you need to sow for a harvest. Oh, my Lord. It speaks to consumption, contentment if you have a problem with consumption and you know there's some things that are out of line in your life, dedicate it to the Lord. Take some time in prayer and in fasting. It is possible to say no to yourself. Do I have any witnesses of that in here, somebody? You, you know, early in my, in when I first really dedicated my life to the Lord through a fast, I used to be a big time spender before that. I'm being trained. I want to be transparent with you this morning. I'm hoping to set some people free. And I used to have a problem with money because I was living at home. I had my first job as an engineer. I thought I made it. You know, I didn't have any house expenses. (laughs) I didn't have to pay for any utilities, living under my mom and dad's roof. And so I thought, you know, I I was Mr. Moneybag. So I'd get paid something, I'd buy an outfit. I'd get paid something else, I'd buy another outfit. I I had every suit and tie on that you could imagine. And I was like, life is good. And until one day my father came to me and said, it's time for you to go. No one would tell my father about this message. Then all of a sudden I got hit with a dose of reality that it's expensive out here. You know, when they cut the life strings off and they, 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 you know, and and, and they, so I went on this fast and one of the things on the fast was I said, I'm not only going to give up food, the Lord led me on the fast to give up television. And and then after that I, I had to give up spending 
And at that time in my life, giving up spending was very hard because that was a habit. And so what I said is everything that I make, I'm going to go ahead and tithe and I'm going to save the rest. And something broke in me during that fast, real talk. I want to talk to some people right now. And <laughs> After that fast, my life changed. But something happened recently. I backslid. And you know what my, my, my backsliding state was? Is I realized I could not get, you know, when you go into a store and they try to, you buy something and they say, would you like something else? And they start upselling you. I, I was very resistant to that. But when the digital marketplace opened up, Amazon, <laughs> you know, you could buy things online and, and now you don't have to go to the store. And now you buy something there and something pops up and says, most people buy these other two items. And, and it puts those two little... How many people in here, you got a problem with some of these digital marketplaces? Oh, go ahead and be, confess your faults that you might be here. And then something else Amazon does now, they'll even say something like, click this button and you don't have to hit, go to checkout. Buy it now with one click. Makes no sense because there's no real line. <laughs> you know, still got me. And, and, and so we all have these things, real talk, that we have to learn to say no to. And some of us need help. Oh, someone talked to me this morning. And I know my wife helps me in the digital marketplace. And I know I help her when we go to shopping malls and all the rest of that. And some of us, we need help. Oh, it's real talk. So that we don't consume the seed that needs to be sown. Oh, someone's going to hear me this morning. My Lord. Let's look at verse 7. It says, so let each one, everyone say with me, each one. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity. Now, this one is a different. It's the attitude of the one who's giving. For God loves a cheerful giver. Point number three, make a faith-filled decision about stewarding the Lord's finances and fulfill it with joy and with gladness. One of the things I love about this scripture, it says, let each one give as he purposes in his heart. It starts with a heart decision. What will I do for the Lord? What is the Lord instructing of me? What should I be praying about? What has God made me for? What has God designed for me to do? What's my purpose? Why did God put me on the planet of earth in 2024 in the month of April? What does God want me to do? And it makes us all introspectively ask the question is, who has God made me? Why has God put me here? What difference does God want me to make? There's a purpose for my life. There's a purpose for my existence. I want to speak that to someone right now. There's a purpose for your life. You're not a mistake. You're not an accident. There's not something coincidental about you. There's a reason why God has you, where he has you, in the place and in the stages where he has you. And when you come to terms with yourself and you say, there's a reason why God has me here, it makes you say, what's God's purposes for me? And when we get to that point, when we say, what is that purpose? Then let me find out what God wants me to do with the seed he's blessed in my life. Because once I start fulfilling God's purpose for my life, I'm a person sowing seed. Oh, Lord, someone helps me right now in God's kingdom. Do you receive that in the house this morning? I've got to do what God's called me to do, be who God's called me to be, because that's my path of being fruitful. And it says, and God, in verse 8, is able to make all grace, someone say with me, all grace, abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have what? An abundance for every good work. Are you seeing that progression? That one of the things that God does, or the way that God blesses his people, is he begins to make all grace abound towards those whom love him. Remember that scripture by the Lord. Paul, he says, I prayed that the Lord might remove this thorn of the flesh from me. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. That word grace, it literally means something that comes from God. It doesn't come from us. I can't give it to you. No one else can give it to you. It only comes from God. In the Old Testament, it's called favor. 
where God says, and let the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us and prosper the work of our hands, Psalms 90. It literally means God sends something into your spirit, into your life, into your reality. It's like a spiritual glow. My old soul, someone's going to get this in a moment. That every person that interacts to you, they're no longer interacting to you. They're interacting to someone or something that's reflecting or resembling God. His righteousness. The way Moses said, the way Moses said, he says, let the work of the Lord, let the favor of the Lord our God rest upon us and prosper the work of our hands. It was his way of saying, Lord, put your beauty, put your glory on us, put your righteousness on us, that anything we put our hand to, people will see your glory. Oh, someone's going to get this in a moment. You're going to get it in a moment. Why, what happens when people see God's glory? How, at the mention of his name, every knee bows. Oh, someone's going to get it. Every tongue confesses that he's Lord. That when God's glory shows up, men automatically fall prostrate in his presence. When God's glory shows up, every devil, every demon flees because they cannot exist in the presence of God Almighty. When Moses went in the mountain and he experienced God's glory, remember when he came down and he had the Shekinah glory on his face and the people said, we can't look at you right now, we're afraid of you. It wasn't Moses they were afraid of, it was the glory. It was God's grace, it was God's shine that was on his face. So when we talk about New Testament grace and Old Testament favor, we're talking about that dimension of God the Father that he puts on us, that people will look at you and see Shekinah glory and begin to deal with you. This is a child of the Most High God. I've got to treat them with a different level of favor and of mercy and of respect and of discernment and of grace because they're of God. I sense something calling me to treat them differently, my Lord. And so Paul is saying, in the Lord our God, he's able to make all grace, hallelujah, abound toward you. How many people in here, you're ready for God's grace to abound in your life? Just say, I'm ready, Lord. Just say, I I'm ready. I'm ready, Lord. We sow, God sends grace. We sow seed, God multiplies the harvest, and God sends grace. And that's the grace that follows us everywhere that we go. He says that you, now with all this grace abounding towards you, always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance. I want to speak this word. The name of this church is called Abundant Life Fellowship. That's not just a name we espouse. That's a name that we need to live, experience, internalize, be a testimony to everyone that looks upon us that this is a place where God abundantly blesses his people. We're not going to apologize for that, nor are we going to be ashamed for it. In John 10.10, 10, that's the scripture in which this name falls, uh, comes from, and it says, the thief comes but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus says, but I've come that they might have life and more abundantly. And that's what this church's name is built on that it doesn't matter what the devil has tried to do to steal, to kill, or destroy. We're looking at Jesus to restore unto us and bring us to a level of life that goes beyond survival and sufficiency, but takes us to a level of abundance that whatever God wants us to do, we can do so with strength, my Lord. That you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance. I want you to underline that word for your life. God wants us to have an abundance for every good work. Say those two words with me, good work. Good. Now, all work isn't your good work. Oh, my Lord. There's a competition for resources. I'm going to talk, talk to There's a competition. What is the good work that God has created me uniquely to do? Where does God want me to sell, my Lord? Point number four, God's grace and favor positions you for abundance, and God's abundance throughout your life positions you to perfect his will. God's will in your life is reflected through the good work that you should be doing. Let me go on to verse nine. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad. 
He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now, I love this verse in verse 10. Now, may he who supplies seed to the sower. Who's the he there, someone? God. So you could say, now may the Lord who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. God provides your seed. I want to share this for someone today who came into this house and you're living in desperate times. And you're saying, you know what, Pastor Arbor, you're saying you gave that illustration of the farmer who has a lot of seed. What about the farmer who only has one seed in his hand? The widow's might. I only have enough for one day. Thank the Lord we don't supply our own seed. Oh, Jesus, someone's going to get this in a moment. Our faith says, may he who supplies seed to the sower. We get our seed from God. Hallelujah. And I want to speak this word today to someone, and you know you're living in a moment of scarcity. God will supply seed in your hand. God will provide you something to sow. God will look not at what you don't have. He will look at the abundance of what he can do, of what he creates, and he will put seed in your hand, in your life, in your experience that's above and beyond what you think you have or what you can do. God supplies the seed. Oh, my Lord. Say that with me. Say, God supplies the seed. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to say, my God, my Lord, will supply the seed from my life. Say, thank you, Lord, of what you are supplying in my life. Hallelujah. Now, I want you to go ahead and thank the Lord for that right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord. I want you to speak to yourself this morning. Say, we have more than enough. Go ahead and say that. Say, we have more than enough. Hallelujah. Say, more seed is coming. Hallelujah. Now go ahead and rejoice in the Lord for that. Go ahead and see that, speak that, see that, speak that, my Lord. He says, may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, may he supply and multiply the seed you have sown. You see, when I sow, there's a harvest. And out of that harvest comes more fruit based upon what I've sown. And the way God does his kingdom system of multiplication in every fruit, there's what? More seed. Oh, Jesus, you're going to get this in a minute. So I can take one seed, and that seed can bear an apple eventually. But in an apple, there's not just one seed, there's many more seeds. And so then if I take the seeds in that apple and then sow again, then I get many, many more apples. Are you seeing this? So you can build a harvest, you can build a forest off of one seed. So when we look at the way God multiplies and we adapt his principles of sowing and his principles of how we sow with cheer and his principles of how we sow with faith, we're speaking a harvest into our life if we remain diligent and faithful. Now I want to tell you today, God won't disappoint us, my Lord, my Lord, my Lord. God will not disappoint your life. So he says, he, he who so, supplies seed to the sower May he supply and multiply the seed you have sown. My prayer this morning is that the seed that people have sown, that we begin to see the multiplication of it immediately. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. The seed that has been sown, may he multiply in the name of Jesus. Then he says, and increase the fruit of your righteousness. Now we're talking about more than the harvest of the seeds, that there's a righteous work that there's a righteous presentation that needs to be shown in seed. In point six, God provides your seed, and he will continue to provide what you need to sow. In verse 11, it says, while you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God, for the administration of the service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also is abounding through many thanksgiving to God. I want to tell you right now, you make a difference in the kingdom of God. What God instructs of you to do, God will outperform it. I can say that with 100% certainty and faith. Whatever God is positioning you to do, whatever God has asked you to do, it's more for you than it is for anyone else. That if God's calling you and saying, will you be faithful in this? 
He's setting you up for a blessing more than he's encouraging you to touch someone else's life. You, the, the way they say it in the old church, you can't outgive God. Whatever God's asking you to do, do it in the name of Jesus. Do you receive that this morning, church? Can you thank the Lord with me this morning? My Lord. I'm going to ask you just to stand for a moment. Because I've heard some of the testimonies. I, we've heard some testimonies that are extraordinary. And we're going to continue to pray that the Lord does this work through this body, particularly this body. But I'm going to read to you a scripture out of Ezekiel chapter 34 and verse 26. And that scripture says, I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing. And I will cause showers to come down in their season. There shall be showers of blessing. Let me read that again. And I want you just to close your eyes. And I want you just to receive this as a word of the Lord. Sometimes we can do all for the Lord and we can think that he doesn't see your need. He's not concerned about your struggle. You may think that I'm worshiping the Lord, but I have anxiety over some affairs in my life. But God wants you to know today that God is ordaining a season for your life. God sees your need. He feels your pain. He understands your concerns. And in the midst of it all, God has a way. God has a plan. God has a harvest. It's not dependent upon what you've done or what others have done. It's upon what you can believe he can do right now in the name of Jesus. I'm going to say this same verse again to you. I just want you to receive this. I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing. God will make you a blessing. And I will cause showers to come down in their season. There shall be showers of blessing. Now I'm going to encourage you right now just to raise your hand. And I want you to say, thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you, Lord, for your harvest that's coming into my life. Thank you, Lord, for this season of my life that I'm living in. I trust you. I have faith in you. And I give you the glory about what you shall do. I have all faith that you have all things and can make all things abound toward me. I will glorify you. I will praise you. I will honor you. And I will be a blessing. In Jesus' name, now go ahead and praise the Lord right now. Let it begin. Let God's blessings begin. Let God's blessing begin. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the prayers that you heard of your people. And Lord, you know every one of our situations. You know all of what we have, all of what we don't have. Lord, you see those amongst us right now that are in a battle for survival, and we see, you even see those who think all is well. But Lord, none of us know what tomorrow will bring. Oh, Lord. None of us knows what the future shall hold, but you do. So we come to you right now with all that we have and all that we don't have, with all the uncertainty that's surrounding each and every one of us, because we don't even know what we don't know. But we do know you as our Lord, as our God, as our Savior, and as our Heavenly Father. And as long as our life is in you, we have nothing to fear, nothing to worry about, and nothing to bring anxiety over. Lord, everything that we've been blessed with has come through your hands or through your approval. And if it's removed, you will continue to bless. You will continue to provide. You will continue to answer our need. We're not dependent on the things. We're dependent upon our gyra. We're depending on our Lord. So today, Lord, we relinquish the confidence we have on the things, and we return our confidence upon you. Lord, will you bless us? Lord, will you touch us? Lord, will you send your grace upon us? Lord, will you multiply the seed that's been sown? Lord, will you put new seed in the hands of your people that they might sow and reap bountifully? 
And Lord, will you change hardened hearts in the name of Jesus, that these same hardened hearts might be filled with generosity and cheerfulness and joy and faith in who you are and what you're doing. Give us the discernment, Lord, to know what seed we should sow, at what time we should sow it, and in what field that it's safe to sow. Give us godly wisdom to do godly work and godly work only, that your word may go forth and people may be saved. In the name of Jesus we pray. Just say with me, we're blessed. Say again, we're blessed. Now go ahead and give the Lord a shout of praise this morning. We're blessed. Hallelujah. Oh, we're blessed. We're blessed this morning. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing. I have one more prayer that I'd like to extend with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're in the house this morning and you're saying, you know, Pastor, today I need to give my life to Jesus. I need to turn my whole life around. I got to start all over again. And I want to call Jesus my Lord and Savior. I will pray with you right now, right where you are in your seat. You won't even have to move. All I'm going to ask you to do is just raise your hand right where you are and I'll lead you in that prayer. I see your hand, my brother. I want to give, I see your hand, my brother, in the balcony. Hallelujah. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I see your hand, my sister. Hallelujah. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to accept him as my Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. Now, right where you are, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and I'm going to invite you just to say these words after me. And church, if you said the same prayer of salvation, you could say it right along with them to encourage them. And just say, Lord Jesus, today I accept you as my Savior and as my Lord. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for shedding your blood to be the price for all of my sins and all of my mistakes. I apply your blood as my price. I am washed. I am clean. Thank you, Jesus, for making me whole. You are my Savior, and I promise you today, I will follow you for the rest of my life. Jesus, you are my Savior. Jesus, you are my Lord. Fill me, Holy Spirit, to be a true disciple of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And I say amen and amen. Hallelujah. Now go ahead and give the Lord a shout of praise. Go ahead and praise him. For those of you with your hands raised, you just made the best decision of your life. Feel free to talk to me right outside after service and we can connect you with our, our Next Steps team because God's doing something in your life. Amen, church? I want you to help me finish this message today. I want you to look at the person to your left and to your right and just say, God's blessing you right now. Can you do that? Find another person and say, God's blessing you.